Uh, if you can still remember, uh, we began the miniseries with one of the most popular scenes from this book, uh, and I would argue from the Bible. Uh, when, when God called out to Moses through the burning bush, right? Most popular scenes in Scripture. Uh, and during the first call out that God made to Moses, Moses responded confidently. Uh, Lord, here I am. Uh, until he heard what God wants him to do. Uh, oh, by the way, Moses, I want you to rescue the Israelites from bondage of slavery in Egypt. Uh, when Moses heard that, he began rattling off a series of five excuses for God to call somebody else. All right? He should have just went to, you know, to the point, but he made all kinds of excuses. You remember, five excuses. Uh, the first excuse was, who am I? Who am I, God, that, I, that you would call me to do this? I'm nobody. I cannot do this. I am not good enough. Uh, and God replied to Moses, well, you don't have to be because I am good enough. I am strong enough. I'm the one who's going to free my people. Second excuse from Moses, I don't even know your name. Right? You guys remember? To which God replies, tell them that I am. That's, that was it. That was the reply. Third excuse, uh, what if they don't believe me? What if I go there and tell them all this and they don't believe me? Uh, God's response, show them these three powerful signs. If you remember the powerful signs were? What? Staff, leprosy, and the water turning into blood, right? Show them these signs so that they may believe. Uh, Moses, after seeing those signs, came up with a fourth excuse. Fourth excuse, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. I'm slow of tongue when it comes to my speech. God's reply, what? I'm the one who made your mouth, and I can enable you to say what I want you to say, <laughs> pretty much. Right? But did Moses uh, run out of excuses at that point? No. One more excuse. One more excuse. I really don't want to go, Lord. <laughs> Please send someone else how did god reply this time his anger was kindled and he gave moses the look remember remember this part when you get the look from your parents you get the look from god that's it you better shut up or it's just gonna get worse right so god's response was anger but at the same time god responded with i would say grace why? Because God not only gave Moses some help in the form of his brother Aaron, uh, Moses, yeah, Moses' brother, God also gave Moses the staff. But this time, if you read the text, it is not Moses' staff anymore. It's the staff of God. Right? Gave him the staff of God, as this will be the conduit by which God will manifest his power through Moses. All the miracles that Moses did, all the great signs he did with the staff. So yes, God was angry, but he did respond with grace as well. Um, and so in the end, no matter how many excuses Moses came up with, uh, God would take no for an answer. And Moses ended up going anyway. Right? Moses ended up going to Egypt, and that's where we're going to pick up our story this morning after I drink some water. All right? So check out or go to your devices and go to Exodus 4, verses 18 to 20. <clears throat> Let's read that again. <clears throat> 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. Jethro said to Moses, go, go in peace. 19, and the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking you or who were seeking you are, your life are dead. 20, so Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. So just like how we do it before, we're going to read, observe, interpret, 
All right? So first, before leaving Egypt, what did Moses do? <clears throat> he went over to see his father-in-law. Not just his father-in-law, but his employer. Remember, Moses is working for him as well as a shepherd. So he goes and pays his respects to his father-in-law, Jethro, first before he left. Uh, now notice Moses' reason that he gave his father-in-law for leaving for Egypt. Moses said, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. Now if you read it and you know what happened before, you would think that what's, what's wrong with Moses? Why is he lying to his father-in-law? He knows that his brothers and sisters in Egypt are alive. Why say, let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive? Why would Moses say that? Right? Um, if you knew the reason why Moses was going back to Egypt in the first place was to rescue his brothers and sisters. He knows they are still there. They are suffering from slavery. That's why he's coming back back to the begin with right to rescue them so why not just tell Jethro about his real mission um, I go to Riken once again as a commentary uh, and I think his uh, explanation is pretty simple uh, let me quote Riken uh, he said Riken said perhaps he was afraid Moses perhaps he was afraid that if he went too much into detail his father-in-law will start raising questions about his trip. Okay? Very practical commentary from Riken. Uh, in other words, not knowing the whole story would probably cause Jethro to panic and even to stop Moses from going. Okay? Because what he's about to do, if you, if you imagine the, the scene, Moses is about to take his family back to Egypt to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go, or else. If you are the father-in-law of Moses, and you know your grandkids are going, your daughter is going, what would you say? You crazy? No, no, that's Egypt. They're the most powerful nation in the world at that point. Why would you go up against them? And all you have is a staff? You must be nuts. Uh, my parents were like that. Uh, the first time I, I brought my kids to Nicaragua, I, I first told my parents. By the way, we're bringing Caleb and Eli to Nicaragua. At that point, they were like 10 and 16 <laughs> years old. And my parents did the same thing. Because I told them we're going to Nicaragua uh, for a mission trip. And they, I already told them what happened before and what the conditions were. Their response was, hey, why do you have to bring your kids? It's dangerous. Can't you just stay here? Why do you have to bring your kids for? We'll take care of them. I think that's what Moses was trying to avoid. <laughs> that's why he didn't tell him the whole truth, the whole story. Um, and I mean, parents, they mean well, okay? But sometimes... God's call can be dangerous and risky, right? Uh, we used to go to this conference called Cross Conference uh, in the States, and um, their target was college kids uh, to encourage them to become missionaries. And a lot of times, uh, these guys in the conference, the pastors and the leaders, they would get in trouble from the parents of these kids once they, go, when they do go to missions. Because it's a dangerous uh, thing. Some of these kids, they don't go to missions in Nicaragua or Hawaii or anything like that. They go to real missions. Church planting missions in dangerous places. And a lot of them might end up dead. And that's why the parents are like, what, what are you doing? You can serve God right here in North America where it's safe. But sometimes God's call is dangerous and can be risky um, but that does not give us enough reason not to go because ultimately if our hope and our help is God himself then we should echo what the psalmist says in Psalm 27 whom shall I fear amen if God calls you to missions yes pay your respects to you 
whoever you need to pay your respects to, your parents, your grandparents, your whoever. But if God calls you to missions, ultimately it is God who's going to protect you where you're going, not your parents. And, and don't let them stop you from going. Uh, same way uh, with the pastorate, okay? It doesn't have to be missions. It could be ministry. When I first said yes to the pastorate, my dad was like, you sure, you, you sure you're going to do this? Right? You have a good job. You don't, need, you don't need this. But I'm like, but this is, this is different. This is God's call. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, talking about when I say, when God calls you, right, he won't, he won't, expect, he won't uh, accept no for an answer. Because at the same time, when he calls you, he equips you, and he promises that will be with you. He will never leave you nor, nor forsake you. Um, and I think that's why Moses um, said what he said. So he wasn't necessarily lying. He was just avoiding more back and forth conversation with Jethro. Um, but at the same time, he was going to go anyway. <laughs> he was just letting Jethro uh, know. And so what happened after that? Jethro gave his blessings. All right, go in peace. You're just going to visit your brother there? Okay, go in peace. All right. Um, now for me, while I was reading that, I thought that that was the first confirmation uh, that Moses uh, had uh, that what he was about to do was in God's will. I think at this point in time, I think Moses is still not sure because he never really said yes at the end of his excuses. God just said, no, you're going. Um, and then one at a time, God started to confirm to him that, no, this is the way. Jethro let him go. And look at the next part. All right? The second confirmation comes in verse 19. Check out verse 19 again. If you can flash that again. Okay, let me just read it. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. This is the second confirmation that what Moses was about to do is God's will for him. God told him, remember that death sentence that you had because you killed that Egyptian? That's gone now. Right? We, we took this up, I think, in chapter 2. When the Pharaoh in Egypt died, remember? That was it. That was the signal that Moses is good to come back. Um, because the guy or the one who was uh, really chasing him down to kill him were dead. Uh, so the death sentence for Moses is over. It's, it's been forgotten. Right? Those who are seeking to kill him, including the Pharaoh at the time, has died. So what does this news do this news gives Moses more confidence, hopefully, you know, that his trip back to Egypt was ordained by God Himself. Right? So God does that. When He calls you, He gives you confirmations. Yes, you're supposed to go. When it comes to missions, when we went for missions, it was always the money that was the problem. Right? We had to spend our own, we had to pay for our own flights, uh, we had to pay for our own, what else? Just flights. <laughs> Everything else is paid for by the church. But to come up with money for flights for a lot of young people is hard. So confirmation of that sometimes is the generosity of others to, to fund your mission. And, and, but God does that. When he calls you, he confirms it. This is it. You're doing the right thing. You're going the right way. All right? So now, what does Moses do? He prepares to go back to the land of Egypt to do God's work okay now the interesting part is what does he bring with him what does moses bring with him you're going back to the land of egypt you're going to go face the pharaoh you know what you're about to do what do you bring with you or who do you bring with you check it out this is very significant for us okay uh because uh let me say this just to introduce uh, like just to give it an intro it's very significant for us what moses brought with him uh, because today, uh, no believer should embark in ministry at the expense of their family. Say that again. No believer should embark in ministry at the expense of their family. And I'm saying that, I'm taking a stand that 
Ministry should always involve your family. Doesn't mean that ministry should always go before your family, but it should always involve your whole family, not just you. Okay? And the reason I'm saying this is because there's this tension between family and ministry. A lot of times there is. I, I see it in husbands and wives a lot of times. When the husband is a deacon, the wife is not involved. Right? I, I saw this before in this church. We would be in a meeting with the deacons, and the wives would be outside the window. You know how our windows have glass? So we can, you can see inside, right? The wives would be in the window. It's only been 10 minutes with the meeting. The wives would be in the window, going like this. Hey, Yorkdale is about to close, yo. I haven't eaten yet. Because there is this tension between ministry and family. And I think this is, Moses is showing us some lessons here that we can learn when it comes to that tension. Okay? And the reason why there's tension is because of this verse right here. Luke 14, 25 to 33. Okay. In, in this verse, Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship. Okay. In the cost of discipleship, Jesus said this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. A lot of people confuse that with ministry. So they're saying, oh, Jesus said, ministry, I have to hate my children. And, uh, uh, just me. If they don't want to come, forget them. Is that what this means? I don't think so. <laughs> Let's not confuse the cost of discipleship with ministry work. Okay, let's not confuse the cost of discipleship. And this is a call for discipleship. This is saying, Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, I have to be more valuable to you than anybody else. Your wife, your parents, your family, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot follow me. That's a call to discipleship, not ministry. Even though you can argue, isn't discipleship a call to ministry? Yes. But you have to be able to separate the two. You have to be able to be a disciple first. And then ministry comes. So as far as Jesus' words in Luke, um, we must realize that we must first be disciples of Christ before we do the work of Christ. This means that discipleship is a personal commitment through faith in Jesus Christ to follow, love, and obey Christ and ultimately grow to be like Him. Now, ministry is the work that comes with being a disciple of Jesus. If you're not a disciple, then whatever you're doing is not really ministry. Because you have a different focus. You have a different mindset. But a disciple of Christ... Has that mindset of no, Christ comes first. But don't confuse that with ministry. When the ministry, when the work comes in, okay, the Bible talks about how family comes first. Okay, and, and I'm going to argue for this. I know there's another side that says, no, 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 God has to come first in everything. And I do agree when it comes to your own personal life, for your own personal spiritual life. But when it comes to ministry, I would argue that the Bible talks about family. The importance of family in ministry. 1 Timothy 3. <clears throat> Paul talks about the office of eldership in relation to an elder's family life. How? Let me give you an example. An elder is called to reflect Christ's love for the church, ministry, Christ's love for the church. How? By being the husband of one wife. Family. Right? So the basis of your becoming an elder and doing the ministry of eldership is how you are at home. If you have five wives, then no. 
you can't be an elder. Or if you, I only have one wife, but I have two girlfriends. <laughs> no, you can't be an elder. Right? Why? Because who you are at home reflects who you will become when you start working in ministry. If you have no patience at home, you won't have patience in ministry. The other thing that Timothy says um, about eldership, an elder must be able to manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Again, ministry, caring for God's church, and family, being able to manage your own household well. If your kids don't listen to you, <laughs> how do you expect people to respect you? At church? If your own wife drags you out of meetings to go to the mall, <laughs> how can you expect to manage God's people? If you can't, let you, if you can't make your wife listen to you, you can't make your kids listen to you. If you can't manage your household, family, how can you manage God's church ministry? Right? Because it comes together. I don't care, you know, if, if you're the only one called to be an elder. I told my wife this because my wife was arguing with me. You're the only one called to be a pastor. Why do I have to be, you know, <laughs> involved in this? Because you're my wife, right? We're supposed to be what? One flesh. So wherever I am, that's where you're going to be. If there's a tension there, then don't go into ministry. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of pastors, I'm going to get into this later on, I've seen a lot of pastors split up with their wives because of, because of that. Right? My point is, when you look at ministry, family always comes first. Family is training ground for ministry. Amen? Do we all agree about that? Okay. Now, um, an article in the Gospel Coalition uh, org entitled Eldership is a Familiar Role says, and I quote, In short, the home is a training ground for ministry in the church. In our ministries, within our families, we gain the experience necessary for shepherding God's family. A man must have his own house in order if he is to faithfully manage God's household. And so, Moses, when he departs for ministry, brought first his family. Okay? Now, what else is Moses showing us or teaching us uh, when he brought his family with him to his ministry? Um, I think that Moses is also uh, showing us how to avoid two extremes when it comes to the tension between our families and our ministries. This is where the debate is uh, in, in a lot of evangelical churches. This is where the debate is, is, is based on, these two extremes. Um, when it comes to our families and our ministries. First, first extreme. There are those who sacrifice family for the sake of ministry. There are those who sacrifice family for the sake of ministry. And now, I've noticed this mainly in the pastoral ministry. Okay, that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to anybody else in the ministry. I just say I've noticed this more on pastoral, on the pastoral ministry. There are some pastors whose ministries are so demanding that their families are always the ones to get the short end of the stick, so to speak, to the point that some PKs, you know what PKs are? PKs, pastor's kids, okay? <laughs> Some pastor's kids have not even, they don't even want to consider getting into ministry. Because of the example that their father, I guess, showed them throughout their, throughout their life. Um, some pastor's kids won't even consider uh, ministry. Now, an article on uh, ministrytodaymag.com gives us five reasons pastor's kids won't consider the ministry. Okay? 
is because the, 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 the main reason, obviously, is because the pastor or the dad sacrificed family for the sake of ministry. But these are the other sub-reasons uh, why a pastor's kid won't consider the ministry. The article starts off by saying this, and, I, and again, I quote, to put it bluntly, a lot of pastors' children hate ministry. Children with a pastor parent can grow to hate the ministry for many reasons. Here's five. Number one, putting ministry before your family. And again, I'm going to quote the article. It says, your kids need to believe that you would rather hang out with them than with the people of the church. Children will learn to hate ministry if you put the, if you put the needs of everyone else ahead of your family's needs. I fell into this myself during my stint at youth. I gave most of my time to the young people because I was discipling. But the time that I gave them, I took out from my kids. And my kids grew to not like <laughs> the ministry. Uh, I mean, thank God that now they're involved in it. Uh, but before, because I didn't put any boundaries as far as my ministry is concerned, my family is the one that suffered, especially my kids. So there is that tension between, again, family and ministry that we have to think about. Uh, and we have to avoid these extremes. Don't, put, don't sacrifice family for the sake of ministry. Uh, second, um, telling your kids, if you're a pastor's kid, telling your kids how much is expected of them as a pastor's kid. So our elders or deacons. Don't put, you know, unnecessary expectations on your children because of your position at church. Okay? It says here, and I quote, pastors can put excessive expectations on their kids because the church wrongly puts these expectations on the pastor's family. So it's not just say, the pastor's fault, the whole church's fault. Right? What this is saying is the church puts all these unnecessary expectations on the pastor and his family that the pastor feels like it's necessary to put expectations on his kids and even sometimes his wife. And it's not fair for the pastor's family. Why? Because there are some people at church who, hey, if you're a pastor's wife, you should be like this. If you're a pastor's kid, you should be like this. If you don't meet those expectations, you guys are no good. Come on. <laughs> uh, let's be real here. We're all of the same body. We just have different functions, right? That's what Paul says in Corinthians. So why put extra expectations on somebody who is public just because? It doesn't make sense, right? We're all imperfect people. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't hold me accountable for what I'm doing up here or for the way I live. You should. But to put any extra expectations on me and my family and therefore, uh, you know, driving me to put expectations on them as well, uh, it's not healthy. And that's what we should avoid as well. That's an extreme Right? We should work together when it comes to that. Okay. One minister's kid said, it was very stressful being a PK because everyone judges you differently like you're supposed to be perfect. And then if you did mess up, it was a bad reflection on dad. We were told that by my parents often. Sad, right? But those are the expectations placed on Kids, pastor's kids, minister's kids, and their families. Um, third, we shouldn't tell them about church, or, or sure, sorry, we should tell our kids, if, if you're a pastor, if you're in the ministry, tell your kids that there are conflicts at church, that the church is not perfect. And as often as possible, tell them that. So that when you're feeling emotionally low and you take it out on your kids, they understand that it's not about them. You get what I'm saying? 
There are days where tensions at church will be brought home. And if, you don't, if your kids think that church is this perfect little bubble that they can, you know, you know, it's all rainbows and butterflies, they don't know that this is the real world as well, then it's going to be hard for them to understand why you're, why you're angry, why, why you get angry. They think it's about them. So as much as possible, show them what the real church looks like. Right? Me and my wife, we don't shield our kids from conflicts at church. Um, although we don't tell them all the details, my wife and I make sure that they know that conflicts come with the territory and that they should try to understand that there are days when we won't be in the best of moods and it's not because of them. That's how you put family before ministry. Don't shield them from the, reality, the realities of church. Amen? I know it's hard, right? We want our kids to think, oh, church is a fun place to be in, or, you know, it's a, it's a good place for you to, to grow in. But you can't make church to be out as a perfect place. Because it's not. Fourth, don't look godlier at church than when you are at home. <laughs> How do you put family first before ministry? Be consistent. Don't look godlier at church than when you are at home. This is the first question I asked the wives when I was uh, choosing elders. How is he at home? Is he the same as he is in the church? Because if he's not, you better tell me now. Or forever hold your peace. <laughs> right? You can't be putting on church clothes on Sundays, and then when you get home, you're a different, whole different person. That's not putting family first. That's putting ministry first. I got to look good for my ministry. Meanwhile, my family can suffer. No, uh, not going to work. Right? Don't look godly at church than when you do at home. One PK said this. Children will grow bitter about watching a parent live an insincere lifestyle. They will assume the faith was all an act, turning them away from you and the gospel. That's how it might affect them. Another PK said this. He treated my mother awful. He ruled the house with an iron fist. Never was grace given. I knew most of the stories in the Bible, but I never learned from observation how to apply them to my life. Why? Because they see something else at church than what they see at home. Another pastor's kid said this, Dad always showed more affection to mom at church than he did anywhere else. Even to the wife. Sometimes some pastors fake it for the sake of ministry. Not healthy. Still another PK said this. Work took a lot out of him, so he was very short-tempered and easily frustrated by his kids. He had a strong devotional life, but found it hard to show grace to the family while showing vast amounts of grace to the flock. If, you, <laughs> if your ministry is draining you, to a point where you, you don't have any more left for your family, something is wrong. Whether it's be time, whether it's patience, whether it's grace, if, you're, if you don't have enough for your family because your ministry is draining you, something is wrong. Hmm? Last one, fifth. Don't act more like a live-in full-time pastor at home rather than a parent. Don't act more like a living full-time pastor at home rather than a parent. The article states this. Your kids need a parent, not a live-in pastor. Okay. You're at home, be a parent. <laughs> right? It's like when, if you're a manager at work and you, you manage, you know, let's say, people at, at, at work, don't go home and start managing your wife and your kids talk like, like, they're, like you're at work. It doesn't work. Same thing with ministry. Right? 
if you're, if you're at home, be a parent. Now, I know that these five things, again, focuses on pastoral ministry, but they can also apply to any parent or anybody who is in ministry or who has a family. You know, always remember, our job as parents is to be pointers, imperfect as we may be, our job is to be pointers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our kids ought to know Jesus through us, through the examples that we set. So let us now make the mistake of putting ministry ahead of our families. Okay? That's the first extreme. What about the other extreme? This other extreme is more prevalent and more common in churches today. So when you look at this other extreme, it applies to absolutely everybody. Okay? What is this other extreme? Idolizing family above ministry. Or idolizing family to the neglect of ministry. Uh, and again, please don't get me wrong. As I've said earlier, when it comes to ministry, family must come first. But to what end? How far does your family have to come first before ministry? I would like to share with you the rule of thumb that I kind of live with when it comes to this tension between family and ministry, and that is if ministry is becoming optional because of family, then I think you've gone too far. If ministry is optional because of family, then I think we've gone too far. God designed the family and ministry to work together for the benefit of God's body, the church, and for the glory of God's name. Elevating one over the other greatly reduces the effectiveness of both in the life of a believer. Right? And I see a lot of that at church. My wife comes first. My children comes first. To the neglect of ministry. That's too far. Right? That's too far to the extreme. Let's, 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 be, let's be wary of that. Let's, let's look at the way you treat your family and look at the way you treat the church. It should be working together, not against each other. God designed it that way. God designed the family and ministry to work together, again, for the benefit of God's body and the church and for the glory of God's name. Elevating one over the other greatly reduces the effectiveness of both in the life of a believer. Now, on the other hand, if you use both, ministering to family as a means to be a more effective church worker and leader, this, what this does is it greatly increases the manifestation of God's love and power over the life of the believer and the family and the church that believer ministers to. Amen? We cannot separate ministry and family family, but we have to find a balance, okay, how we minister to both. And God designed family to be preparation for ministry. So yes, family comes first, but not so far ahead of ministry that you neglect ministry. Is that clear? Especially those of you with kids, younger kids, please listen. So now as Moses leaves for ministry, first thing he takes with him is his family. Does his family come first? Yes, he, took, he brought them first. Right? But at the same time, is he bringing them for the sake of the ministry? Yes, because where did he learn patience? Where did he learn sacrifice? Where did he learn all that stuff? Raising his family. Moses takes with him his family first. What's the other thing that Moses took with him? Exodus 4.20. So Moses took his wife, his sons, and had them ride on a donkey, went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hands. So simply put, again, that staff used to be the staff of Moses. Now it's the staff of God, and God uses this staff as a symbol of divine authority that he has given Moses. 
It is with this staff that Moses would later accomplish great wonders. Okay, if you know the story, you know what I'm talking about. He split the Red Sea with this staff. He turned the water into blood with his staff. He called plagues with his staff. He uses the staff to accomplish great wonders. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that the staff of God is a magic wand. Instead, we should look at the staff of God as a visible sign or a manifestation of God's saving power. What else did he bring with him? God's saving power or the manifestation of God's saving power. Well, what about nowadays? Remember when we talked about how God can use any one of us as Moses? Because we're like staff in his hand. What about nowadays? What is the staff that you bring alongside your family? When you're going to mission. And when I say mission, when you're going to evangelize, make disciples of all nations. You bring your family, yes. You bring your staff also. Nowadays, what is that staff? Let me give you a clue. It's also a piece of wood. Uh, two sticks this time. It's formed in a... <laughs> the gospel. That's our staff. That's God's saving power. It's through the gospel. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the cross is its sign. That's what we bring now, right, as a staff. So that not only we bring family, we bring our staff. We bring the gospel with us. That's why in this church, what do we teach? The gospel, right? The gospel. It is a sign of God's love, grace, and mercy for all. This is how God saves nowadays. Again, Reichen comments, in the cross of Christ, God accomplished the greatest exodus of all. What is that? Freeing sinners from slavery to sin and into a relationship with God. This power of God to save through the cross of Christ is the staff that we carry today as we preach Christ crucified for the propitiation of sin. If you don't bring that staff, if you preach the gospel and talk about just God's love, then no, you're not. That's not the gospel. The gospel is twofold. God's salvation and why you need it. Why do we need salvation? Because we are all sinners, born sinners. The only way to salvation is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's only through his sacrifice that God will be pleased, that God will be appeased. No other blood can do that. I hope you understand that. And that's what you bring with you. That's what you bring with you on ministry. Your family and the gospel. Now, let me give you a preview. Let's keep reading down. Okay? Let's start at verse 24. And this is what we're going to be taking up next week. Twenty-four to twenty-six. So Moses is on his way, family in hand, staff in hand, on his way to Egypt. Then this happens: at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Who's him? Who? Who's the Lord trying to kill here? Sounds like it's Moses, right? And then 25, then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And then 26, so let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So Moses is on his way to Egypt, about to obey, family and staff in hand. Or everything that God said he would do, he's doing. And then he stops off at a motel somewhere. God's waiting there trying to kill him. <laughs> Why? What, what is with that verse? You want to find out? Come back next week. <laughs> I just want you guys to start thinking about it now. 
Because I've been thinking about it for two weeks now. <laughs> what is this for? What is it trying to tell us? Why is God trying to kill the guy he just told to go to Egypt to go save his people? Why is he trying to kill him now? What's the point of this verse? Come back next week um, and we'll take that up. But for now, we'll stop here. We'll continue the rest of our story next week. I hope to see you all again. Let's bow down our heads. Let's pray. Gracious, gracious, gracious.